Are you ready to pray? In the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, for an anointing to be upon this pulpit. And when I talk about this pulpit, I meant the man that stands behind this pulpit. I pray that my lips, Lord God, would only speak the oracles of God, that my mind would be set on the things of God. My heart would be set on, not on things of this world at all, but on things that are all around you right now. And I pray somehow that I would be able to project, Lord God, what you would think, what you would have for this body. I ask for your guidance and your direction through every bit of it, every word, every note, every fluctuation of my voice. May it be in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Lord has touched my life so many times that I can't even tell you, uh, Jesus, it was said of Scripture that if they would have wrote down everything that Jesus did while he was here, the books couldn't even contain it. <laughs> and I think about my life. <clears throat> Cindy and I's book is out. Um, it, you could get it on Amazon. It's called Gunshot Witness. And so you, you could get that book and you can read it. But you know what? That covers this much of our life. It covers a shooting where I got shot in the back six times. I still have three bullets in me and 110 pieces of shrapnel and around there, right close to there. And I'm alive to tell about it. But that's not the first thing that has happened to, to me and Cindy and I. And we just tend to just like keep going down this road and things happen to us. But the Lord stands us back up. And when I look at it, um, some of it really bums me out because, it's, I, you know, it's really difficult for me to use my right arm. And, and to uh, the biggest miracle of all is I could sit at that piano. So uh, when I can't feel even what's happening on, in my right arm. But I'm telling you that God wants to use us. But there's going to be something that happens in the end. And there's going to be a huge portion of the church that's going to fall away. And they call it apostate. And it's an apostate church. And the word apostate, which we're going to study in a minute, literally, it, it, it's a dictation of something in your life that you believed in, something that you walked by, something that you were disciplined in, and you totally left it. And we're going to find out where that word even comes from with a group of angels in Jude 1.6 where they actually left their first estate, apostate. In Joshua 24.15 is where we're going to start. And it says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, in other words, if you really don't want to serve the Lord, you think it's bad to serve the Lord. You think it's better if you don't serve the Lord. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But Joshua is saying, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to stay with it. They're two separate worlds. There's two separate leaders in the world. One is Jesus Christ. The other, Lucifer himself. You either serve one or the other. I don't know where I got er, it's or. One or the other. That just our slang, isn't it? Somebody from another country comes and listens to us. They're like, what did he say, man? So you're going to serve one or the other. You can't help it. Now I want you to turn to John 17. We're going to talk about something that I need for you to concentrate on. I need for you to really go after. And I'm going to make a statement right now that you're all aliens. I'm going to prove it to you. And the devil knows it. And it makes him mad. And I don't do that to try to get any of you shot. I'm just... I'm doing that to try to convince you that the demon that filled the man that shot me saw something there, and he was able to see something that the enemy did not like. Do I look like? No, I don't look like that. And I'm not an alien in the form of what they think is an alien, but my citizenship is in heaven. 
And it's another kingdom. And we need to be kingdom-minded, the kingdom of God. John 17, starting with verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep, keep through thine own name. The word keep means to preserve, defend, sustain those particular people. Ready? To save from apostasy. That word keep is to save from apostasy. If you are a five-point Calvinist, I'll tell you right now that the word apostasy gets one of those points knocked off because you can't be apostate unless you had a belief in a system that you walked by, lived by, and you abandoned it. You left it knowing what it was. And I'll prove that in a minute. But it says, Those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. All of us need to be one. I get tired of so many arguments over, you know, we may differ a little bit in Scripture because we're reading Scripture that was written a long time ago, and you don't know the culture that it was written in. You don't know sometimes who it was written to. But once we actually study all of it together and figure that out, then we always come to the same conclusion. We really do. I've never known somebody long enough to be able to get with them all the time where we go, you know what? That's probably what they mean. Praise God. And I don't know why we have to have arguments and fightings and divisions among us. One of the worst things that Jesus speaks about is all the divisions that happen in church. And do you know what caused divisions and contention and strife? Proverbs said, it's pride. It's pride. I have to be right. You're going to find out something when you see God. Okay, it may really hurt you, but guess what? They're not going to be right. You're going to stand before the Lord, and I could just imagine all the incredible things you're going to try to teach him. <laughs> but Lord, I got to tell you about this. I know, I know, I know what you said, but and the Lord's going to go, what? You're kidding. I didn't even know I said that. <laughs> you are brilliant. Oh Not. <laughs> but you see, we do that down here. You won't do it when you meet him, but we do it down here. We argue and fight and bellyache. They did it in the land of Israel, did it. The whole 40 years they were in the wilderness, all they did is <laughs> whine and cry. Poor Moses. Here God said, take them out. Lead them into the land where there's going to be all this milk and honey and plenty. And all they do is. <laughs> They'd have got there a lot sooner if they weren't whining and crying all the time. But for 40 years, they just cried and belly. You know, welcome to America. We have everything. You got a roof over your head. You got, trust me. Does it look like we're lacking food? <laughs> I have three X shirts. I could wear two X, but three X make me look thinner. <laughs> and believe it or not, I can literally easily survive. Sometimes I even forget to do that, but one meal a day. My metabolism has slowed so much that I could eat one meal a day, and I'm still, look at me. I just save it. <laughs> I think my body knows something's coming. And so he says, we're just going to save this for later. <laughs> How did I get on this subject? I think I was looking at you, Lakai, and automatically I started thinking, man, I need to go on a diet. <laughs> Let's go to verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I've kept, and none of them is lost, but there is one. And he calls him the son of perdition. That was Judas. That the scripture might be fulfilled. He knew what Judas was going to do. 
I often think, okay, he hasn't lost any but one. What if he really went after the one? Could he really have won the one? I mean, he is Jesus. Could he have done it? But the scripture needed to be fulfilled. The one would betray him. He let that go. Judas had a will too. Judas was in love with this world. And what Jesus was trying to tell him, when you're in love with this world, you're going to serve one or you're going to serve the other. If you want to serve the world, then you're a part of the world. If you want to serve me, they're going to hate you because they hated me first. People are going to hate you when you start preaching the gospel. People are going to hate you when you start telling truth. I can prove it. I can walk up to people in this church. And I can start giving them truth and say, you know what? This is what you're doing. This is what you shouldn't be doing. And you need to change your ways. And I can do that in love. Man, the truth, mm, it hurts. And they're all of a sudden not going to like you. They're not going to like you. Try to tell the world that. Try to tell your neighbor, hey, you need to get saved. You're going to hell, man. Now, obviously, that's probably not the best way of presenting the gospel. <laughs> Bob, you got to get saved or you're going to go to hell. Oh, but I'm a nice guy. Yep, nice people are going to hell too, Bob. <laughs> but I really love Jesus. The Bible said, if you love me, you'll keep his commandments. You are far from keeping the commandments. Yeah, but you don't understand. And we can make a debate. But if you try to tell people what the Bible says, not what you think, but what the Bible Bible says they're they're offended. They're mad. Now they hate you. Now they're going to real life. (laughs) They're going to real life. They're going to new life. They're going to go over to get a life. But wherever they're going to go, the bottom line is, is they don't want to hang around me anymore. Okay? And, And I tell everybody, I love you. I'm never going to lie to you. I'm not going to hurt you, okay? But the truth hurts. The truth hurts. And what Jesus is saying right here, there's only one of them, the son of perdition, because the scripture needed to be fulfilled that went his way. And the son of perdition, remember that Judas had somebody come into him. Satan entered into Judas in the last. The two times that we hear about this particular thing happening. I don't want to get out of order. I about took a whole different trip. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means. Whenever it says by any means, then you need to understand that They're going to try coming from the left, from the right. They're going to be trying to come straight on at you in a head-on collision, or they're going to knock you out from behind. But by any means, don't let anybody deceive you on this thing. Okay? So that means pay attention. Pay attention. For that day shall come. That day, or that day shall not come, and listen to what it says, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Though that word, apollyon, means ruin, loss, destruction. It's the son from the seed of the destructor. This is where Satan has entered in to these particular people. You find it in John 17, uh, Philippians 1, 28, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, and I could go on and on. The father of this son is in Revelation chapter 9 in verse 11. Let's check out the father. And they had a king over them, which is the angel, the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue it's Apollyon. Now, Baden is a state of ruin. It's a state of destruction. The term is parallel to what we know to be Sheol, hell. Hell. That place is a place of absolute ruin, separation from God, 
people that take on the unholy spirit where he actually enters into them become a part of that seed of Satan. Long story short is that perdition is a place where ungodly men go where it's a condition of absolute ruin of one's life. But before that day, when Jesus comes back, certain things are going to take place. And this is where we call the apostate, this falling away. So there's going to be a big portion that belong, I'll say belong to the church. And these particular people that believe that somehow I believe in God, I believe in God, I believe in God. But something has happened to that relationship to where that belief that they have in God becomes the belief that even the angels and Satan himself believe and even they tremble. But somehow you have a belief system, but you have no relationship. And those particular people, I believe, it's really easy just to lead them astray. You say, well, I don't believe that God's people are going to be able to do that. Well, how about the one sheep that just goes out there? Why would they need to go after him? Why do they need to come back? Why does James chapter 5, 19 and 20 said if one errs from the truth, you need to go after him. Let me tell you something. It says that you have saved that soul from death. If you again, after receiving the knowledge of Jesus Christ, get entangled again into the world and the affairs of the world again, it says that the end will be worse than even at the beginning. Well, in the beginning, you were lost. In the beginning, you were on your way to hell. How could it be worse? Because... When I know Jesus and I feel his presence in my life to ever walk away from it, I can tell you, I would feel so bad. It would be worse. Isn't that true, Jesse? Isn't that true, Alora? Isn't that true? I could point to many people in this church. Anthony, isn't that true? to once know Jesus Christ, be in love with him, and again, get entangled in the the affairs of this world. You felt like death warmed over, like it was going to kill you. Because you want to know why? Because that was his intent. To, To absolutely steal from you, to destroy everything around you, and then go in for the kill. But you know what? Jesus saved you. And he reached down and he rescued you. There's people in here, watch this. Let me just, let me just try to to bring out how the enemy works today and how good God is. Are you ready for this? How many people in here have actually died from something stupid and came out? Raise your hand. Okay, do you see all these hands? They died and came back. Some of them are narcan probably the majority. You want to talk about the goodness of God? <laughs> to give you a second chance? Some of you a third chance? I know a guy that has died five times. He still do- does the same things that he did before. Because he thinks he can escape death now. Oof. God have mercy. There's going to be this huge falling away. The word apostasy means a standing away from, a falling away, a withdrawal, a defection of one's faith or belief. It's not found in the English uh, versions of the Bible, but it's used twice in the New Testament. In the Greek original, to express an abandonment of one's faith. Paul was falsely accused in Acts 21, 21. Paul was falsely accused um, of uh, apostasy of Moses, leaving what Moses had said. It's apostasy from Moses. He predicted the great apostasy from Christianity foretold in Matthew 24, 10 through 12 which would precede the day of the Lord, 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. So apostasy, not in name, but in fact, meets this huge rebuke in Jude chapter 1 and verse 6. And in Jude 1, 6, we're going to walk through the meaning of apostasy. 
It says, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, it's a place where they were, a place where they were created to be, it's a place where they knew God, and it says, but they left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness into the judgment of that great day. That's where we get the literal word apostasy. And that a lot of people can do. You have left your first estate. You don't believe me? Look at the rebuke that Ephesus had in Revelation chapter 2. Ephesus who left their first love. And he said, oof, if you repent, <laughs> okay, and you get back. He says, I'll still give to you to eat of the tree of life, which sits in the midst of the paradise of God. But you got to repent. You left your first love. I would highly recommend don't leave your first love. When you do, it's painful to get back. I could literally pick 30 people right now. I could walk to this congregation, and I could pick 30 people, and I could bring them right up on that stage. And I can have all of you just ask him questions about it. How hard was it to come back? Some of you, you should be preaching today. You guys should be in ministry. But sometimes it's just a hard road to get back to that first love to where you were. And I don't say that in rebuke. I'm saying that, that God's grace is has kept you somehow and, and will bring you back. But when you lose your first love, it is difficult to strive your way back to something. Amen? It's hard. Scripture is all about trying to keep your relationship. He is wooing you by the Word of God because the Word of God is Him. And so He talks to you all the time. They left their own habitation. Verse 13 of John 17 says, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You know, for us to be able to spread that joy, this is what he says. I want you to tell everybody I'm coming back. Tell everybody I'm coming back. He said, in doing that, tell everybody about my resurrection and my return. He says, and you're going to give them some great words of comfort. That's how you're going to do it. Then why is everybody so depressed? There's, let me tell you something. There's nothing worse than hanging around with a bunch of depressed Christians. I'm serious. John and I make fun of it. If you ever talk to John or I, we have a famous saying, but how you doing? Oh, it's really tough, man. My name has been written in the book of life. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for me because, you know, I'm, I'm on my way to heaven. And God, he, he really has me. And, you know, man, my kids are all saved. My wife loves me. But I got a good reason to be depressed. Well, what is it, Pastor? Well, people don't understand. It's, it's just tough. What's tough? Well, I got shot. I mean, that's, it hurts all the time. But you see how easy it is to justify your way out of joy? And all of a sudden, I can sit here and tell you about my pains and my woes and my, but guess what? My name is still written in the book of life. And my kids are serving the Lord. My wife still loves me. Our moms are still alive and they're serving the Lord. Our dads went on to be with the Lord. Let me tell you something. My life has been a dream come true. Amen? And even though I actually, it was a dream come true because I dreamed over and over that I would be shot. So it came true, I guess. So my life is literally a dream come true. <laughs> Never thought of it like that. No wonder I'm depressed. <laughs> so, 
Why are so many people depressed? Depression is a mindset. It's what's driving America to suicide. Jesus said he spoke in the world that we should have joy fulfilled in us. Direct words from Jesus. And yet, depression is taking the church by a storm. It's like a tornado that just comes through, and when it's done, it flat puts people in depression. It could be in your relationship. I was ministering to a guy a while back, and he was so depressed because his wife was going to leave him. And it's interesting how it didn't take long before all of a sudden he has this joy back. And you ask him, what's going on? He's like, you seem so happy. My wife left me. It's like, one part of you was just really all choked up about it and you were going to die and now your wife left and you seem pretty happy. What's going on? And by the way, whenever that happens, you almost know what's going on. Because there's somebody else. He hooked his eye on somebody else. And guess what? That is not what is going to bring you joy. I love my wife. But let me tell you something. In our relationship, it's Jesus that brings us joy. Without Jesus, we're pretty boring. <laughs> I, can, I can sit on my chair and I'm just trying to veg. I've talked to people all day long. I just want somebody to slap me in the face. Get my attention off of all of this. I just want to veg. Cindy takes my arm, starts working my arm, and it starts cracking and everything to try to keep it flexible for when the nerves come back to it. And we sit there, and we can sit there for three hours and never say a word. You know why? We're married. I say that in jest, but if she says something, I already know what she's going to say. And if I get ready to say something, I start saying it, she'll finish it. So why in the world do we need to talk? How did I get on this subject? Joy, thank you very much. It's Jesus that brings us joy. I love my wife because Jesus loves me. I couldn't love Cindy the way she needs to be loved unless Jesus was right here. Cindy could never love me in the way that I need to be loved except for. Let me tell you something. My wife has never left my side. When I was shot, she never left me. She was right there the whole time. Never wanted to leave. I'll never forget the first time I left the house without her. I got in my car. She was in the driveway standing there waving to me crying. Going, dear, are you sure you should be driving? I came out of a wheelchair to get behind a wheel. Then I thought, yes, I should be driving. <laughs> Cindy was all worried about it. And it's like, Faith? Faith? I may not be able to walk, but that doesn't mean I can't drive. <laughs> Man, couldn't wait to drive. I've given them, now check this out in verse 14, I've given them my word. Now we're talking about the joy. Everybody needs to have that joy. Half, half of the population almost in America, there's, we know that there's 50 million Americans that are on meds for depression, hardcore meds. There's 50 million Americans outside of that that are depressed that are not on meds. So there's 100 million Americans. There's only 340 Americans million Americans and a hundred million of them are depressed how many of those are in church I talk to them all the time I'm depressed pastor why why are you walking through the desert with Moses are you remembering something of where you came from and it depresses you because you can't go back to that particular point let me tell you something Depression is a mindset. But here he's trying to tell us, get out of your mindset on this world and your affections mm, 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 should not be in this world. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the world. 
And when you become kingdom minded, your depression will leave. Amen? So I've given them thy word, and because of that, that word is Jesus. Don't separate them. I've given them the word, that's the truth, logos, and the world hath hated, which means to detest them. People detest you. Why? Because truth hurts. Truth hurts. There was one of the candidates that were, that were running. I know a lot about him. I wanted to say something bad. He kept firing towards John. This guy is a pervert. I have all the facts that I need. I could have brought every bit of that to surface, and I go, no, he's going to lose anyway. So if I get involved in this, then he's just going to, but you know what? He claims to be a Christian, and he claims to be, a, and I'm telling you, this is a deadly place for him. Where do I get involved? Because Christian to Christian, if I were to speak truth into his life, he would absolutely detest me. He would hate me. Isn't that something? Christian to Christian. Hmm. Something's wrong with that. You see, the reason that we speak truth, it's because it's for the saving of souls. That's why we speak truth. Something happened. You know, we got, God bless you, Stan. Stan is 90 years old. And he seems like he's got this second wind that hit his sail. And he's even wanting to finish his sailboat. But something hit him, and it's a book that you could get right out there on prayer. And I, when you get that book, and you start reading that book, that book's going to get you involved in a relationship with God. He's holding it up right now by Ian Bounds. Okay? And... He's going to start a Bible study on that at his house on Sunday afternoon soon or Saturday and Sundays. But God is doing something special. At 90 years old, he's got a second wind in his life, and God has brought him back to where he should have been the whole time. But God brought him back to a point to where now he's got the joy of the Lord, and that is providing him with strength at 90 years old that he never had before. And we have, we got mama out there. She's going on about 170 now. <laughs> and she's still just sailing. Well, what keeps her going? Okay, I'm telling you, it's Jesus. It's because we have more waiting for us there than we have here. I look forward. America is so sinful, it kills us babies before they were ever born. And one day we're going to get to heaven. We're going to have all of these babies, young people that are going to be standing there. And when we enter in, yeah, I would not doubt it at all if they line the passageway to the pearly gates. And we have to pass every one of them and repent. Say, I'm sorry. Sorry that we, that we allowed this. America's the worst. We kill without repenting. We're leading in pornography, money-wise. We absolutely, absolutely take the young men and young women out there and we sell their bodies. We human traffic. America is the leading person. America could very easily be the mystery of Babylon. And all of the stuff that we do and selling all around the world and providing, the, being the merchants and providing for the rest of the world when we're actually so in debt, it's absolutely ridiculous and the people's lives are so in danger that we don't even see them. Welcome to the Laodicean Church of America. We used to be the lead, sending missionaries out to absolutely give the gospel and the truth out to the rest of the world. Now, the rest of the world can't wait to send missionaries to America to spin it back around because we have lost our first love. 
If we had our first love, we would never kill our babies. There's another world in the midst of ours. It's called the kingdom of God. We need to identify it. We need to live in it. We need to operate in it. We need to move and breathe and have our, or literally being in that world. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. And a citizen in the kingdom of God thinks about the kingdom of God. You want to think about the kingdom of God? There's a way that you can think about the kingdom of God. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It's not practicing all of these works, 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 works. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. If you want to get your life set before God on that holy highway, you must be in the word. If you're not in the word, you're in trouble. I could tell you something. John Padula has never read a book in his life. I can't get him to read a book. John, you want to read? Sandy and I's book is done. You want to read it? No. He said, I watched it. Well, yeah, but this gives the whole... He's not interested. There's one book. He made it to the eighth grade, and he's brilliant. I'll say that. He's brilliant. That guy has a mind that won't quit. If I forget something, I ask John. Johnny, what was... It's like we're married or something. He ends my sentences. But let me tell you something. Here's the book that he reads. That's it. And because of that, he is teaching people like Dan Auga. And when Dan Auga gets a hold of this book, now he has a ministry mighty to save. So we started out with set free, Johnny. Now we're going to mighty to save, Daniel. And now we're going, you understand where this goes? It just keeps on going and keeps on going and keeps on going. Why? Because here's your relationship. It's right here. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. If you don't want to sin, you don't want to be angry, you don't want to be bitter, you don't want to have malice, you don't want to have, then read that book. Because that book says that you are guilty of every bit of it. And so when you have this against somebody else, stop it. Because if you don't forgive them, you can't be forgiven. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you want to be in love of the world, good luck. People say, well, I love God, but I can't help it. No, stop it. You need to understand the word is the word. Stop changing it. Well, just because the person lives in the world and just because he's sinful doesn't mean that it... No, it says, you ready for this? Can I, can I read it again? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You don't have the love of the Father for that kingdom. You have the love of the enemy for this kingdom. And because of that, you'll be in this kingdom. You'll have what you love. If you do not separate the love for God and your love for this world, you're in trouble. Your love for God gives you a dislike even hate for the things of this world. I absolutely hate sin, even when I do it. Hate it. I hate it when I get angry at people. I hate it when I just want to throw somebody out of the rehab because they're being stupid. And it just hurts my heart really bad. But guess what? I'll do it. I will do it because I have to do it. But I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it when somebody drops off. I'm a pastor. And I know that there are sheep in here. They just keep, they just, they keep running. And back then they had these little canes, these shepherd staffs that they would run around and if that sheep ran in front of them, they would take the end of that and they would hook that back leg and they would just twist it right out from underneath and break that back leg. To stop them from running. I'm ready. I am ready. Except nowadays, those staffs, we don't carry them anymore. I got a nine millimeter. <laughs> yeah. 
Run! Makes a good target. We need the practice. John and I and Danny and Kurt will stand back here. Look, that one's running. Five bucks. Back left leg. Why? Because we love you. We love you so much. And when it's done, you'll just sit there and laugh. I can't believe you shot me. Of course I shot you. I'm trying to save your soul. Forget about your leg. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James chapter 4 and verse 4, he calls them adulterers, and adulteresses know ye not that friendship, that's philia, that means a fondness and a, an attraction, an attachment. You can't let it go. It's keeping you from, from uh, getting to the, the groom, the bridegroom. It says, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity, which means a hostility, a reason for opposition, a hatred with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. So if you want to be a friend of the world, be a friend of the world. But just know that if you are a friend of the world, you're more attached to the world than you are an enemy of God. You say, well, that doesn't. Just because I like this, that, this, that, this, that. Just because I like women. Just because I like booze. and Just because I like drugs. Just because I like money. Just because that doesn't mean that you need to understand that you need to line your doctrine up with the word and stop taking the word and trying to line it up with your ugly lifestyle. The Word of God, when it comes in, wants to purify. If you stop justifying all these other things, I promise you, it will do that work. Because here it says, by doing that, you're an enemy of God. So am I going to believe you, or am I going to believe the Word? I'm going to believe the Word. You know how enemies, how many enemies of God are sitting in the churches today? I could give you pastors. They will absolutely deny that they are, but I could prove it by the word that they're an enemy of God. They have skewed the gospel so bad that they have become an enemy of God instead of a preacher of the word of God. I don't need to name them because you know them and you can sense it. John 15 and 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. He chose you to be out of this world. That means you're an alien. You're an alien. Alien's a simple little thing. We have illegal aliens that come in from the southern border. Okay. By the way, if you guys ever leave, if you come through the southern border, you can get 3% loans, a free cell phone. Oh, never mind. It's horrible, isn't it? Look at our world. Our world is in a very dangerous position. In verse 15, going back to John 17, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, so don't just lift them out because that's, that's where we need to be to learn right now. But that thou shouldest keep them from evil. This tells us that we're going to go through it. Whether you like it or not, you are going to go through it. And the Lord's just not going to reach down and take Don and Kim out of the world just because they're going through it. The Lord's going to leave you in it and say, make a difference. Moses 40 years. Moses, I'm not taking you out. Make a difference. Isn't that something? 40 years. I don't know that I could do that. I really don't. Not without the Lord, anyway. He says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Well, if we know where Jesus went, and we know that Jesus wasn't a part of this world. He was, I mean, even though he was made man, he was still. But he said, when I leave, I'm going to send you something that's going to absolutely separate you from this world. And it's called the Holy Spirit. You become the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you receive Christ in your life and the Holy Ghost is alive and well in you, it changes you. You don't have to try to change it. To your lifestyle it changes you 
to become kingdom minded. Did you hear that? It's in the relationship. It's interesting. They say that when you get married, when you have a relationship with somebody for a long period of time, you start acting like them, you start looking like them, you start, I mean, Cindy and I, I don't know if we look alike, but we do act alike. And we have the same doctrine. I don't know anything that we really disagree with. She said that possibly it could be mid-trib that the Lord comes, and I'm, I'm definitely a pre-tribber, but she said it's possibly mid-trib. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to fight Cindy over scripture, that's for sure. I'll lose. <laughs> but I can tell you that we are one. We are one. We can't help but be one. And so Jesus said, just as you and I are one, I want them to be one. I want them to think alike. I want them to have good doctrine. I want them to have the gospel in their life, and that gospel in your life gives you a love and a passion for Jesus, and you won't have good doctrine unless you have that love and passion for Jesus. It's a guarantee. It's an absolute guarantee. I will tell you that people that get their doctrine messed up lost the relationship. But if I'm in love with Cindy and we're hanging out all the time, then guess what? We're going to have the same. Don and Kim have the same. Even in politics, they have the same. They think the same. They even like the same foods. Why? They lived together for a long time. Ed, Sybil, you guys have lived together a long time. You think alike. You know you can finish the other person's statements. One is just a little shorter statement. <laughs> but the bottom line is that comes with the relationship. And so if I love Jesus, then, and I'm one with Jesus, then he's going to give me proper doctrine. But if I don't have a relationship with Jesus, my doctrine is going to come from the pride which puffeth up, Corinthians says. I'm going to read the word just so I have the information. And let me tell you something. All the knowledge does is puff you up without the relationship. Knowledge puffs up without that relationship. The relationship is what gives us humility. And that humility that's within you, that's the driving force that we need. It's the humility, knowing this is really cool. I can't do this without God. I can't make another step without God. God, what do you want me to do? Well, Tim, I want you to turn left. Yeah, but I really like this over here. Tim? Okay. I'm going to learn to love this over here. That car is really shiny, man. So he says, they're not of the world. How does a person live like we're from a different world in this world? The answer comes up in verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Through thy truth. And what does it say that the truth is? Thy word is truth. You want sanctified? You want to be set apart? You want to grow? You want to stop what you're doing and have a good life, a clean life? You want to get on a holy highway towards, towards what redemption is really meant to do? Thy word is truth. Read it. Study it. Dan talk, uh, Danny talked about it last week. You can abide in it. It could be a world that you ab absolutely live in. People are going to think you're weird. Like, weird. Where are you, man? Oh, right now, the Bible says I'm sitting right by Jesus. They're looking at you going, uh-huh. Right. I'm kingdom-minded right now. Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm thinking about Jesus right now. Heavenly things. They think you're weird. Why? Because you're not of this world. People in this world think like this world. People from another world think. Johnny thinks ministry. Wherever he goes, he's bear hunting. But I guarantee you, while he's bear hunting, somebody's going to get saved. While he's in politics, somebody's going to get saved. 
Johnny will literally think of you on the toilet and call you. I won't get into the conversations, but he will call you because everything he do, does is ministry. Think about that one. <laughs> Sanctify him through the truth. The word is truth. The word is Jesus. To live in his world, you have to know what his world looks like. And to know what his world looks like and to experience that world it's all right here. It's trying to tell you what that world looks like, who God is, what God does, how God operates within his kingdom. It's right here. I hope you got that. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. Jesus says, just like you sent me, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He says, now I send them to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, obviously, you have the Holy Spirit in you because you by yourself can't do squat. Okay? Well, I can do one. <laughs> I've had to practice my squats lately. You can't do anything without Christ. Nothing. But he said, literally, just as I came to seek you to save that which is lost, with the power, with the authority of, of God, you have now become kings and priests, ambassadors of the Most High to be able to represent who God is to other people. Just do it. And watch what God does. Just do it. You know what happened, even though John came in second on this, I look at all the people. We have very important people that lost their positions, even as PCs precinct commitment and I look at that and go oh no but you know what I also look at it and go you know what there are people that were in there that could probably take a little break and start praying for other things and then watch those particular people that were all against it and now watch as somebody's going to approach them something's going to happen and they're going to become believers in what we know to be actual conservative and we need to represent God in our party. I say our party because I belong to a party that will not, absolutely, I do not want our party, which is the conservative party, okay? And I am the, a part of the conservative Republican party because why? Because the other party represents killing our babies, number one. It does not bother them at all. I will not be in a party that represents that. I will not be in a party that supports everything that is against family values. I will not do it. You say, you're acting like it's a sin. Listen, if you say that you believe and become a part of that party and you believe what that party represents, I say there is something wrong with your life because you can't do that and claim that your name has been written in the book of life while you stand for killing babies and representing the destruction of America's families. That's not a part of the kingdom of God. Say amen if you believe that. Amen. amen. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through that truth. Jesus being that truth. We're set apart through Jesus to have what it takes. If you don't have it, go back to the beginning. John 17, 20, you need to pray I for these things alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. You have the word of God. And later on down the line, your children's children's children have the word of God. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to read the word. And that word will change their life. You, we have been benefited so greatly by having this. They have tried to destroy this for years. They come out with versions that leave out. If you could leave out, if you could leave out a virgin birth, then you've absolutely destroyed something. And they did. I could go all the way back. That was the good news Bible that came out a long time ago. Left out the virgin birth. What if you leave out the deity? What if you leave out the trinity? What if you leave out... You understand what they're trying to kill. And they would love to come out with those particular versions. That way you can't prove certain things about God. And let me tell you something, 
You better know what you believe and you better know why you believe it because you're going to answer for it. Verse 22 of John 17, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The reason the world will think that Jesus has been sent by God is because you're going to be representing it. There's a light that lights inside of you that God is going to use to affect other people's life. He's going to get you. Let him get you. Let him tackle you to the floor. Let him deal with your garbage. And stop fighting him. Stop justifying the reason that your marriage isn't working. Stop justifying the reason that that relationship went to pot. Stop uh, justifying why you're angry and mad and upset. And I don't want to talk to them and they don't deserve me. And, and let me tell you something, pride is going to kill you. Everybody thinks in our last days it's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah and everybody thinks it's just going to be the sodomy and the homosexuality and everything. The Bible actually makes it clear that it starts, that actual sin starts from one thing. It's called pride. Where we think we know more than God. The day you think you know more than God, I'm not going to stand by you. We are the examples of sanctification in a holy manner. Our culture should look like His culture. Our lives should be patterned after His life. Do you understand that? I say that because I love you, but that should dig right at your heart because our hearts today, the Bible says, are deceitfully wicked. And of course we're talking about the world, but if you love the world, your heart is going there. He says, and the glory, that glory in verse 22 is doxa, means honor, it means dignity, which thou givest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. So there is a glory that is within you, that honor and that dignity, that light that is within you that came to a flame, that comes from God, that's going to shine on other people, it's going to make us one in our minds, because we're taking on the mind of Christ, the culture of Christ, the life of Christ, and I don't care what happens, it's going to come down very soon in the future, very near future, where the church will be absolutely set apart. And if this church preaches Christ, they'll want to burn it down. Did you hear me? They're doing it all over the world. The churches where I was, up in Nagaland, just south of that, when, when we left, they started burning some of those churches. God have mercy on them. Little grass huts, folks, but they were in love with Jesus. Look at us. If any churches need to be burned, look at the United States. Verse 23, I and them and thou and me. We're talking about the whole oneness, these five verses here. It's all about being one with him, that they may be made perfect in one. Made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. If I represent Christ well, then you will know by the love that I give you, you'll know that Christ is real by the love that he gave me. Because you can see it operating through me to you, through you to each other, and then through each other to the world that is out there to lead every single one of those people to Jesus. And you know, the hardest people to lead to Jesus are ones that think they're saved. And I am not joking. I am not joking. They're the hardest. The hardest people to come in our rehab, it's not the sinners. We have people in here that have shot other people. We have, they're, I don't know if they're here right now, so I don't want anybody to be in panic. We have people, I mean, they're felons. They've done some things that they're not proud of. And yet, they're getting saved. The hardest people to reach for Jesus are the ones that already think they're good people. Well, I'm a good person. Uh-huh. You almost just want to go, never mind. I'm going to go to this guy over here that shot somebody because he's ready to receive the gospel. He understands his sin. He understands where he is in this world. But good people, there's only one thing that's good. And that's God. 
<laughs> One thing is good. And if you, if you have any good in you, it's God. I have nothing good in me but God. Nothing. I'm, I'm done. I'm like Paul. I'm the chiefest of sinners. The things that I really don't like to think, the things that I really don't like to do, I find myself doing. I find myself embarrassed before God. And somehow it just makes me feel like I need God more and more all the time. Father, I will. And I'm closing with the last three verses. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. That he's asking you to be with him where he is. Until John 14 comes along and he says that I will receive you into myself. That where I am, you're going to be with me also. And it says that thou lovest me before the foundation of the world, O righteous Father. The world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. The world has no idea who you are, but I do. And these have known that thou hast sent me. In other words, you have no idea really who he is except through Jesus. Through Jesus, he says, if you have seen me, then you've seen the Father. I would like to say that if you've seen me, by the Holy Spirit that's in me, because they're one, I would like you to say that, wow, I've seen Jesus through you. Am I Jesus? Nope. But I hope you see him through me. And I've declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. The word of God has drawn a picture of heaven, the person of Jesus, the place for the bride, the likeness of his glory that we shall have because it's a true reality. It's not what we keep looking at. This is a true reality. The place is a true reality. That dimension is a true reality. You could live there. But you have to start thinking. And having faith in the truth. Bow your heads with me if you would. All right, now, for any of you that are here, I want you to listen to me very carefully. If you're not in that place, you're not there, you know you're not there. You want to be in that place. But, oh, man, you're having a really tough time. Would you do yourself a favor? And if you want, I'm going to do something a little different today. I would have you to come and just stand right out here. Because I'm going to pray for all of you at the same time. But if you're looking for that place where you can actually experience who Jesus is in his kingdom. And you want to get in the word. You want to experience the word. Experience who he is. Then I want to pray for you. So if you would, would you come? And I want whoever, come on close to over here if you would. And I just want those people to just line up up here in a row. I don't want you to be shy about it because... That's the very thing that has kept you away. I don't want you to be ashamed necessarily of what you have done because by doing that, it keeps you away from the actual presence of what God really wants to do. But I know that there is a group of people and in that group of people, I know that God is going to do something special. And it's not gonna be in a real churchy group. They really won't. They haven't got it done yet. I look at people. God bless you guys. I look at people that were blind and now they can see. That were deaf and now they can hear. They were in the world, but now the Lord brought them out of the world. And the experience that you have dealt with, 
That is what I'm looking for because that is what the world is going to experience through you being they're going to experience Christ through you. Congregation, if there's no more that's going to stand up here, then I'm going to ask you to stand and just put your hands towards these people here and I'm going to ask you to please when you do that, I'm, I just ask you to please mean it. You can pick out whoever you want in here. You can pick them all out or just one of them, two of them. But these people that are up here, you're asking to experience the kingdom of God, to think in the kingdom of God, to have that experience in your life. God's going to do that. Because He's faithful. He's faithful. So in the name of Jesus, I ask, Father, for you to bless, Lord God, all these ladies here right now. They have been through things. They have seen things, Lord God, that I don't even want to see. I don't want to experience those things. I don't want to be a part of that world. I want to be a part of your world. And I ask, Father, right now for you to dismiss all the garbage, Lord God, out of their life. We don't want to be a part of that world anymore. Please, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll wash them so clean, Lord God, that they won't even recognize themselves. And I pray, Lord God, that their world, Lord God, would be holy and pure and righteous. And they would experience the kingdom of God. And I want to thank you for it. I want to praise you for it. I pray, Lord God, that our lives would be open for it and stop the shame. No more shame, Lord God. There is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but today we walk after the Spirit. So let that happen. I thank you, Lord, for the, the young ones, Lord God, that are struggling. They're trying. They're trying hard, but they're in the place, Lord, where it has been hard to be able to find you in their world. In their world, they're mistreated. They're not even treated as ladies. They're things, they're just things. And I ask right now that you'll make a lady out of this one that is found perfect in the sight of God. And that can only happen in the kingdom of God. Father, I ask Lord God that you deal with this one in a way, Lord God, that you haven't dealt with her before, Lord God, this really has to be a change in mind and a change in her heart. And I pray that you'll do that even right now, Lord God, that we would have faith to believe that. Let it happen. We believe, Lord God, that you're going to do something miraculous today that will actually change her to never go back to that which she was. We are now going forward to the kingdom of God where the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is within you. Well, we accept that today in the name of Jesus. Father, for the men, Lord God, that know where they need to be, but they haven't got to that point. He's trying to do all the works, but even all the works, Lord God, it still makes it difficult because he still feels a lack. Something's wrong. He's lonely in one aspect. I ask, Father, for you to absolutely redeem him, to pull him in, Lord God, to give him everything that he desires, everything that he needs to be able to do that which you have called him to do, Lord God, all the tools, everything in Jesus' name. Thank you for the new families that are being formed. And now, Lord God, I pray that this family, Lord God, would be caught up into the kingdom of God. And this child, Lord God, would know what it is to be raised with the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And may it be perfect, absolutely perfect. Lord, set her mind straight. Set her heart straight. May it be absolutely on you, just on you. Stop any type of sin, Lord God, that generates from this mind. And help her, Lord God, to absolutely 
hold her thoughts captive. In Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for the reality of what you're doing in our young people today. There is something, Lord God, that's going on. It's a real hunger for righteousness. But, Lord, what is so beautiful about some of them is that they see their sin. Because in so many of them, Lord God, they don't even see their sin anymore because their culture, Lord God, is, is one thing. But Lord, here's somebody that recognizes their sin, knows what it is, Lord God. And just because it's not ba as bad as the other person, he recognizes that a sin is a sin is a sin. And, and he really wants to be in the kingdom of God, to recognize his calling within that kingdom, to do that, to follow it. And I pray, Lord God, that you will give him the ability to be able to do that. Make him an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And the whole congregation, Lord God, as they're praying for this right now, I ask that there is faith, Lord God, to be able to obtain it. And to know that his calling is a high calling of God. So let him see it. And if he sees it, Lord God, I believe he'll chase it down. So let him see it in the name of Jesus. Keep him from the evil, Lord God. It's only a distraction. Thank you, Lord. I just want to say thank you. For the people, Lord God, that are striving to get there, the ones, Lord God, they may fall, but they get back up. They may fall again, but they get back up. And so I pray, Lord God, that when they get up now, it's a different, it's totally different. Because now, Lord God, they could feel the hand of God reaching down and picking them up. It's no longer, Lord God, us striving because we're wounded to get up on our own strength. But it's the joy of following Jesus that gives us that strength. The joy of the Lord is her strength. Give her back her joy. She's fun. She's full of that joy when she's there, Lord God. Give it back to her in the name of Jesus. Lord, there's so many but I ask, Lord God, for a genuine heart. I pray, Lord God, that you'll make leaders as we follow Jesus. The word, Matthäus. To be a teacher, we must be a learner. Let them learn. And forgive them, Lord God, of their sin and cleanse, us, cleanse them from all unrighteousness. You did not come to condemn the world but that the world through you might be saved. No more condemnation. No more condemnation. You, Lord God, have raised her up, Lord God, to be a wonderful person. I pray that the strength of God would be within her right now and she would humble herself in the sight of the Lord. She would be saved. And she would be led. Thank you, Lord God, for her heart. Sometimes our heart, Lord God, is a lot bigger than our mind. So I pray, Lord God, that you will give her a mind that follows the Jesus that's in her heart. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will take, Lord God, these men and you will make men of integrity, men of honor, I pray, Father, that they would be a part of the army of God. That when we stand up, Lord God, that people would see the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, our loins would be girt about with truth, our feet would be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We'll hold the shield of faith. And I think in the very end, by the time that we yield that sword, we'll know that the word of God is there. When we hold that spirit up, They'll know that it's the Word of God. And when we speak the Word of God, it'll cut deep. Give them that authority. Give them the joy to be able to proclaim it. Make them not ashamed of the gospel of peace. In Jesus' name, I pray for the families, Lord God, of them that are striving. I pray, Father, that you will bless them and keep them then you'll help them to be men of God over their wives and the wives, Lord God, to submit themselves underneath you, Lord God, which 
puts them underneath their husband, Lord God, to be there as a helpmate, to make sure to hold him together. And I ask, Lord, that please, if you would, Lord God, can you just give them the strength that they need? They've tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. And Father, I, I praise you right now because you're a God that picks up failed people. But when you do something, it doesn't fail. So from now on, do it through them. Protect his family through all of this. Help him, Lord God, to never go down the direction, Lord God, that he should not go. But I pray, Lord God, that the warning signs will pop up and he'll see every single one of them. We rebuke, Lord God, that spirit, Lord God, of pharmakia. And we ask, Father, right now for you to wrap your arms around this young man, Lord God. I pray that you will hold him so tight that he will experience you right now. He'll never go back. He's done. Absolutely. He's done. I pray, Lord God, that you will give him a relationship back with his family. He's desperate, Lord God. He's lonely. Even, even when he's around people, he's lonely. He seems like he's all alone. He's desperate. He's been pushed back into a corner. But Lord, no more. Let him know, Lord God, there's a big family that loves the daylights out of him and he can restore his family that the enemy tried to destroy. He can actually bring them all back together through Christ. So let that happen. Let him believe it. Let him stand on it today. In the name of Jesus, put it in his mind, put it in his heart. Thank you for faith. I ask, Father, that you give them faith. Give them, Lord God an absolute evidence of things they can't even see that is before them. They don't have to even go backwards at all. That's done. That's, that's back there. So that's done. But today, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And let them have faith, Lord God, that they can do that. Let them not slide away from it at all. Let them do things right. And let them start out right now do things right and let the Lord be responsible for the result. We praise you for it. In the name of Jesus, make sure all of them get it, Lord. Children included. Children included. Thank you, Lord, for all of these men that are here right now, and I ask, Lord God, that you please bless them all. Bless them all. They're here because they're searching for you. The Bible says, seek and ye shall find. Let them knock and let that door be open to them. Let them ask so they can receive of you. But I pray, Lord God, that you'll give them the ability to do that because so many people think that they've already done that and they failed. They've already done that and they failed. No more failure. If they seek, they will find and they will not fail at it. Let them knock hard and let that door be open. And when they go in, Lord God, let them find the peace that passes all understanding because that's where they're going to find it. It's in that door. Go through the door. And don't be afraid of going through the door. Some people, Lord God, feel that they have failed their family. They feel, Lord God, that they, they really can't be accepted again because they're mess-ups. And Lord, there's no greater thing that you could ever do is to go to a mess up and get them cleaned up so they can be forgiven of so much, so they can love so much. So let them, Lord God, be forgiven and let them go out and love so much. We rebuke anything that raises itself up against the authority of God. And we ask, Lord God, for an absolute peace of mind and peace of heart. Relieve, Lord God, these men, Lord God, that have so much anxiety inside of them. Release them from it, Lord God. It's all in the past. Today, Lord God, is a new day. In this new day, you have redeemed him and you put his name in the book of life. And we thank you and praise you for that, Lord God. Nothing could take that away. So hold on to him, Lord God, and let him know that his name is there. Let him know that he's been forgiven in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What an honor it is to be around men, Lord God, that are humble, 
men, Lord God, that have chosen to serve you, men that have chosen, Lord God, to come and say, hey, what about me? I need to be on that road. I need to serve the Lord. I need to love the Lord. I need to be where God is. I don't need to be in my world anymore. I need to be in his world. Let them, Lord God, repent for the true things that they have done. They don't have to say it out loud, Lord God, but I believe in repentance and I believe that when they do, it's a real deal and God can forgive them, but let them speak in truth, Lord, and let them want to turn from it. Please give them the will to want to turn away. And in the name of Jesus, I ask for the joy of the Lord to be his strength. Pray, Lord God, redemption, Lord God, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. We accept that now, that you died for his sin, and that you were resurrected, Lord God, to maintain, to maintain what that kingdom is all about. You said you would do it, and you did. And now you're coming back, Lord God, to resurrect this church. So let him know he's forgiven. And he's okay. And that you're going to restore everything that the enemy has stolen from him. All that stuff may be gone, but what you have for him is absolutely unreal. Let him see it. Give him the mind to see it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for this congregation. I thank you, Father, that you have forgiven all of us. That happened on the cross. I thank you, Lord, for redemption. I thank you, Lord, that you got a plan for each of us. I pray that we will live that plan out, Lord God. We wouldn't let anything stop us. They may shoot their arrows at us, and they may get us every now and then in the back. But I'll tell you what, as for me and my house, we're still going to serve God. And we're going to pick up our bed, and we're going to walk. And we're going to do what the Lord told us to do. And in that, we're just going to expect miracles along the way. And so, Father, we just want to stand here and praise you for who you are and give you the glory and the honor for everything that happened today. Thank you for switching up, Lord God, the sermon. And thank you, Lord God, that my name has been written in the book of life. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and the congregation says, so be it. God bless all of you.